The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV. All content in the Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series has been created for informational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this television production. Welcome to our Stay Strong, Live Long education series on falls prevention. Brought to you by the VON, the Upper Grand Family Health Team and our community partners. Falling is the leading cause of injury-related death among seniors and the number one contributor to loss of independent living. In fact, one in three seniors over the age of 65 will fall each year and falling just once doubles your chance to fall again. It is our hope that through this Whiteman Telecom production that we can change these statistics for Centre Wellington, empowering our community with the knowledge and tools we need to prevent future falls. Today's session includes the topic of home and environment safety. And we have with us Amanda Froze from the Upper Grand Family Health Team, and she is our occupational therapist. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome. All right, thanks, Julie. So again, my name is Amanda, and I'm an occupational therapist with the Upper Grand Family Health Team. And in my role as an occupational therapist, I really look at how people are able to do their day-to-day -day activities as safely and independently as possible. And for most people, they do most of those day-to-day -day activities in their own homes. So today we're gonna talk about that home and environment safety. Um, and throughout this whole series, we've talked a lot about you and your body and the things that you can do for yourself. Um, and today we're gonna expand that a little bit to be able to talk about your envir the environment around you and the role that that has in falls as well. And so this is important because like I said before, spend a lot of time in our own homes and also having guests to our home as well who may be at risk of falls. So it's a great opportunity to look at not only the falls risk for yourself, but for your family and friends too. So what we're gonna do today, as you can see um, on our slide here, is, a, is our lovely little home. And we're gonna take a tour through the home looking at all the things that you might be able to do to uh, reduce your risk of a fall. Uh, so we'll start walking into the house and through some entryways and hallways. We'll stick on the main floor in our living room and kitchen. We'll pop down and have a look at the basement before going upstairs to the bedroom and the bathroom. Um, as you'll note that this house may not quite look like yours and everybody's home is a little bit different. So um, these are pretty general things that can hopefully be applied to you and your home. Um, but there may be some things that are missing or some things that you think of that were not included today. So hopefully you can apply these things uh, to your own home. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the entrance. So this is the front entrance of our beautiful home. We've done some nice landscaping. It's a beautiful day. Um, but there are some things that we can change, even though it looks quite nice. Um, there are a couple things we can look at. So I want you to think about the entrance to your own home. What entrance do you typically use the most? Do you park your car in the driveway and walk in the front door? Do you park in the garage? Do you walk up from the sidewalk, a side entrance or parking lot to your building? And kind of think about what that looks like before we go on to this. This next slide here highlights some of the things that we could change. So the first thing is having a well-lit space. This is especially important if you go out in the afternoon but come back later in the evening or after dark. So having things like lights that are on sensors or timers can be really helpful so you don't have to remember every time before you leave, oh, I might be back when it's dark out, I should turn the lights on outside. Making sure that even the pathway leading up to your entrance, whichever one that is, is lit as well. The other thing is having railings up any steps that you might have. So whether it's only one step or six steps up to your front entrance, it's important that you have something to hold on to there. And some people even find that the threshold into their home can be quite large and might install a grab bar right beside their door frame to help them get up and over that step. 
and then the walkway, walkways or driveways. You want to make sure that they're as level as possible, that you can see any changes in, in grade, and that, especially in the winter time, that you have really good snow and ice removal. Whether you do that yourself, whether it's family or friends, or you're, you're paying someone for that service, that it's someone who's going to be able to do that on a regular basis for you. So then we'll head on inside, and maybe the entrance to, your, to our home looks something like this. So um, an entryway to your home, your, maybe your front foyer is a place where you take off your coat and shoes and you make your way into your home, do the things that you need to be able to do. So this entryway has a couple of things that we might like, but more things that we don't like. So we'll have a look at those. So the first thing is, you know, it has a little chair at the front entrance, which is okay. It's uh, good to be able to have a place to sit down and take uh, your shoes off or put them on, uh, but it might not be in the best spot for us. And then you can see there's a ton of different rugs all over the place. So lots of different levels. They're kind of, some of them are a bit askew. Um, if possible, we want to get rid of those completely. If you're super attached to them, make sure that, they're, that they lay flat, that there aren't any rolls in them, uh, that the edges aren't curled up or anything like that. And there's lots of different products out there to help you to be able to lay your mats flat and so that they don't slip around. You can see if you look kind of all the way down the hallway that there are some parts of the hallway that are nice and wide and what we're looking for is about a meter or a yard um, width to be able to make it through pathways in your own home and towards the end it's quite narrow so that's less than ideal. We want to make sure that you're not bumping into furniture and things like that as you go. So here you can see a bit of a, a, bit of a different picture. So some nice wide hallways, uh, a non-slip mat at the entrance, making sure that that's something that doesn't move around when you step on it, but it, that collects water and debris as you're entering your home so you don't bring that all in with you. There's a place to sit, some good lighting, and that wide space. Something to think about in the entrance that um, is, it's a place to take off your shoes from the outside, but probably also put on some indoor footwear. So things with a good sole on them, um, things that surround your whole foot so that you're not slipping in and out of them, so that you have some good traction around the home. This is also a place in the house where some friendly pets might come to greet you and be very excited that you've been away all day. So just to be aware that that might be happening so that they don't trip you up with all their, with all their love. So we make our way further into the house, you'll see our living room here, which looks pretty good, especially in comparison to our entryway. Um, but you'll see that there are a couple of things that we'll want to talk about coming up in the next one, and we'll circle them here. So the first, the things that are the ma main concerns here are things that we might put on the floor, whether it's stacks of books or newspapers, uh, maybe a jacket that we threw there, um, things like that. We want to make sure that those are all up and off the floor out of, ways, out of places that we normally walk, any sort of clutter. Then there's also a, an extension cord that's running underneath some of the furniture there. We want to make sure all those extension cords are out of walkways. Sometimes those sockets aren't in good places and the only way that you can plug something in is to reach a cord across maybe a walkway. If there's no way to reroute it with other extension cords, then there's also things that you can get to cover up wires on your floor, um, different, different covers or even tape as long as you're replacing it regularly that it lays flat to help prevent tripping over it. If you are going to use something like that though, I do recommend that it's even though it might not look as nice, that it's a bit of a different color than your flooring so that you can see the difference in that space. There's a couple of yellow things too. The distance between the couch and the coffee table there is a little bit narrow in one spot, especially if you use something like a walker or a cane. You might want a little bit more space around there. And then we have our friendly family pet, uh, Mr. Whiskers here, who likes to nap on our rug. And we just want to be aware that He's around, he might go up and down the stairs with us, he might be at the end of, our, end of our bed, all those kinds of things, just around in the back of your mind. There's also another rug um, that Mr. Whiskers likes to sleep on, and so that rug looks a little bit wavy, it's on top of another carpet. It's quite pretty, but I, it's not very necessary in the place that it is, and so we really just wanna take that out if we can. So here, we've moved the newspapers, uh, we can't get Mr. Mr. Whiskers to stop sleeping in his favorite spot in the sunny spot on the, in the living room, but that's okay. But everything else, we've removed that cord um, and it's a lot safer of an environment. 
So here's just to summarize. We want to remove as much clutter we, as we can from living rooms, moving cords out of walkways, making sure that there's enough space to move around all of our furniture, especially if we use a mobility aid, and remove any scatter mats wherever we're able to do that. So we'll head on into our kitchen. And there's a couple of things that we want to make sure that we're being aware of in the kitchen. Um, there's a lot of hazards there already, and so we want to make sure that it's as safe a place as possible. One of them is there's a lot of spills, water, all this kind of stuff, gunk on your kitchen floors that stuff happens in the kitchen. And so we want to make sure that we're cleaning up spills as quickly as we can and that we have, and sometimes in um, high areas that you might spill, so by the sink if there's lots of dripping water, that you have one of those non-slip mats that might be able to absorb some of that for you. The main issues for falls though is standing up on things like stools, chairs, counters, tables, all kinds of things to be able to get those things out of the highest cupboards in your kitchen. And these are things that we do not recommend. If you can avoid getting, having to reach far over your head, anything where you have to stand on your tiptoes is probably too far out of reach. Anything that you need within, you know, pretty much every day or every week, it's best to keep it kind of between uh, maybe your knees and your shoulders. So anywhere in an uh, easy to reach area that you're able to move it easily. So if you have uh, plates that you're using on a regular basis, cups, pots, pans, all those kinds of things that you're not having to climb up onto the counters like this lady in our slide here. So there's some things that we can do to help us out with those things. So um, a, a mop of some sort to help clean up those spills. There's things that are long handled reachers to be able to get things that are higher up so you don't have to go as high. Um, usually we talk about lighter items for that. You don't necessarily want to be pulling heavy things out that you're not holding on to. Um, and then a step stool. That's a great thing to have around. It's a, it's a great investment. Um, something, some things to look out for when you're picking out a step stool is that uh, the width of all the steps are big enough for your whole foot, that they have nice rubber grips on the bottom and non-slip surfaces, a big wide base and a handle that comes out around front so that you're able to hold on to something as you get up there. So like we said for the kitchen, move things into the most easily reached locations clean up spills as soon as possible, and use a step stool to reach any high places. So now we're gonna head downstairs, and you can see in this picture on the left, we have maybe what we don't want the stairs to look like, and on the right, uh, we have our ideal set of stairs. So on the left, we're looking at things like, oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this as well, I'm going to be going upstairs later, so I'm going to just put this on the stairs until I go. Or, or I need to bring this down to the basement, so I'm going to store some things on the basement steps. So then when I go down, then I'll remember to take them with me. And these are pretty significant tripping hazards, especially because they're things that aren't always there, um, so you're not always expecting them to be there. So we want to make sure clutter is clear from the stairs and the handrails. The one on the left has one railing, which is pretty good, but we, if, if possible, it's great if there's two, one on each side. So you can use both when you're going up and down, or if you have a preferred side, um, that you can use the railing on the side that you prefer. And you can also see the one on the right is far uh, better lit. So we wanna make sure that lighting is uh, really good in those areas. So like we said, handrails on both sides, good lighting, and use it. Um, make sure that you're actually turning on the lights before you go down the stairs. If you still find that your stairwell, it's difficult to differentiate between each of the steps going down, that you find yourself missing a step or that kind of thing, you can go to your local hardware store and get some really colorful duct tape and just place it along the edge of each of your steps so that it's a really obvious um, where each of the different steps are. Keep those stairs clear of clutter and avoid carrying big loads up and down the stairs. So when you're carrying a big load, you can't necessarily see where all the steps are in front of you, and it's easier to trip and fall. Also to throw you off balance if you're carrying a load that you might not be able to handle. A lot of people have laundry in the basement, and this is something that you do on a regular basis. So what I recommend is if you have, um, you can get a canvas laundry bag or a mesh one, put all your laundry in and just throw it down the stairs. 
then you don't have to carry it. Some of them will also um, come with shoulder straps on them and you can wear them as a backpack type thing as you go up and down the stairs so that you can use those handrails and your hands are free. You can also um, bump the laundry basket up each of the steps so that you're not carrying it with you. One other thing I should mention about basements while we're kind of here is that you should always have a clear path to your electrical breaker box and around your furnace in your basement. So making sure those areas are clear because if your power goes out, you wanna make sure that you're able to get safely to the areas of your house that are important to be able to get to that you don't often frequent. So now we'll head upstairs into our bedroom. We have a nice light and airy bedroom here, but again, there's some things that we can do to improve it. And you can see them here. So. First of all, probably the most obvious is some of the, the laundry basket at the base of the bed with a pile of laundry there. Um, to, again, to remove as much clutter or anything from your walkways that you can. The other thing is the person who's sleeping on the right side of the bed has a lovely lamp. So if they have to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, they can flick on a light and they have good viewing to be able to get there. But the person who's sleeping on the other side of the bed has to wake up the person on that side of the bed to turn on the light to be able to get to get going or they get up in the dark trip over the laundry basket and have a fall so we want to make sure that everybody has their own light that they can reach from wherever they're sleeping the other thing is is to be able to have um, a phone near your bedside in case of emergency so if something was to happen that you were to feel unwell during the night or if someone needed to reach you urgently um, sometimes we're not in our most steady and mobile state first when we wake up, so it's good to be able to have that right there. We also wanna keep any glasses, hearing aids, anything like that as close to us as possible and um, not to venture to the bathroom at night without our glasses. The things in yellow here are things that we just wanna watch out for. One of them is the height of the bed. You wanna make sure that when you're sitting on the edge of your bed that your feet are able to reach the ground. You don't wanna feel like you have to jump out of bed to get up and get going. And the other thing is, is this rug looks pretty good and pretty flat, but we just want to check it out. I can't see any of the corners to see if they're curling up or anything like that. So just something to look out for. So, like I said, a light and a phone that you can reach from bed. Also, glasses, any mobility devices, canes, walkers, that kind of thing. Space to be able to move around all of your furniture. Make sure that you close all of your drawers or closet doors, things like that that you might bump into being sure that your feet can touch the ground when you're sitting on the edge of your bed. And one other thing is to be able, um, is to sit to get dressed. So you can sit on your bed or if you have a chair in your bedroom. Um, sometimes as we get older, our balance isn't quite as good as it used to be. And standing on one foot to put our pants or socks on can be a little bit more tricky. So just having a seat um, can help to be able to uh, prevent a fall that way. And the last but not least room of the house is our bathroom. And I took this one straight from the little um, cutout of our house to show you all the things that, this one's not quite good. And I don't think it was designed to be a good bathroom, but we'll point out some of the flaws in it anyways. One of them is that that toilet looks really, really low. So it's probably quite difficult to get on and off of that toilet. The other thing is there's not even a shower curtain. Water's gonna spray all over the place and we're gonna make sure, we're gonna see that we'll have lots of slips in that bathroom with water pooling everywhere. The other thing is there's a towel rack in the shower that looks an awful lot like a grab bar and we'll talk about those later but towel racks are not to be used to hold any body weight. And you can't see it here but there's probably not a non-slip mat on the floor or in the tub there. So we'll have a look here at some things that you really, really want to avoid. So on the left, there's a picture of a surround tub that has one of those clear uh, towel racks. And I call it a towel rack or a washcloth holder because it's not at all designed to hold any body weight. The, and then the one on the right here is your regular towel rack. And again, not meant to hold any body weight. So if you find that you're holding on to these things and you're relying on them to be able to get in and out of the tub or shower, 
it's probably time that you ask your doctor or call the CCAC for an occupational therapy home assessment because we can help you find out a safer way to be able to get in and out of that tub um, and avoid pulling those right out um, while you're holding on to them and having a fall. So I just want to reiterate that these are meant to hold the weight of maybe a wet towel and that's about it. And so you want to avoid putting any force or body weight on those and really just avoid holding on to them when you're transferring in and out of that tub altogether. So this is uh, a huge and ideal accessible bathroom. Um, maybe ideal in some ways and not others, but I really just wanted to show this to be able to show you all the different kinds of things that might you might be able to have in a bathroom to help you be more safe. So there's bath stools, there's raised toilet seats um, with handles, there's clamp-on grab bars and um, bath chairs, there's a um, handheld shower head to be able to sit down in the chair and use the shower head. So tons of different things. Um, and this slide here just shows even more objects that you that could fit. And so that's why I really recommend an occupational therapy home safety assessment because every person is different in their physical abilities as well as their bathroom and their budget. So all those things kind of go together to be able to determine what you're able to put in your own bathroom. And we wanna make sure that it's the right fit for you and for your needs. So I'll put that contact information at the end if you want to speak with your doctor about a family health team occupational therapist or call the CCAC directly and ask for that assessment. So um, we've come to the end of our, the tour of our home and we've made our way through lots of different areas. And I just wanted to reiterate that everybody's home is different. So you might have heard some things today that don't apply to your, your own home, but maybe to a friend or a neighbors. And um, you might also have some ideas of your own that you've, come, that you've come up with that have helped to reduce risk of falls in your own home. So uh, I'd like to leave you with a bit of a challenge. So uh, to be able to go into your own home, step out to where you normally enter your own home and take a tour for yourself. Now that you have a bit of a fresh perspective and some new ideas, walk through and take a look at maybe one or two or three things that you could change uh, fairly easily to make uh, your home a safer place. You can do this together with a friend or a family member and then swap homes afterwards. There's all kinds of things you can do to be able to get some new and fresh ideas. Also, if you need help with some of those more complicated rooms, places like the bathroom especially, um, you can call the CCAC or speak with your doctor about getting an occupational therapy home safety assessment. So I have that contact information here as well. So that's all that I have to talk about today about, your, about home safety, but I welcome any questions that you guys have. So the question was, are there any types of funding or grants available for home renovations um, to, for safety? And so I do know that there is a, a tax credit, I believe, um, that you can apply for. I don't know how much money that you're able to get from that, but you do have to wait until you get your taxes done the next time before you're able to get that money back from, um, from your renovations. Um, so the comment was that they had previously had a big concrete slab poured in front of the front porch and they had a number of, of friends and uh, visitors who weren't really able to navigate that step so they had it totally removed and put in uh, four inch steps that were a little bit longer. So that's great, especially for anybody who's using a mobility aid to be able to, it's almost small enough that you could bump a walker up yes. and that you can use a, a cane on it more easily, especially when you have those railings. So that's great. Um, if you're planning any home renovations, things like that, this is definitely something to take into consideration. So if you're planning home renovations in the bathroom, you can speak, um, you can talk to your doctor, see if they can refer you to an occupational therapist, or um, even speak with contractors about how do we make this bathroom most accessible before you make those changes. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was um, the space between a couch and say a coffee table for someone who's using a walker. And this is going to be a little bit of trial and error based on your own size as well and the size of your walker. So you want to make sure that your walker can fit all the way in, but if you're someone who wants to sit in that middle seat of the couch, your walker is also going to have to be able to turn with you so you can place it in front of you. So it's going to be a little bit of, I would recommend that you um, have somebody with you 
that you pull the coffee table completely away and that you do a trial run of what's comfortable for you and they kind of look to see what was that end range for you and then move that coffee table into that spot. So it's going to be a, a little bit of trial and error that way, but I think that would probably be a good strategy to test it out. All right. And now to present uh, the session on fire safety is Larry Bolin, and he's the Chief Training Officer with Centre Wellington Fire Rescue. Thank you, Larry, for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to do a small uh, display for you on fire safety for uh, older adults. Uh, a lot of uh, people are staying in their own homes now uh, longer. They want to carry on with that, and I'm, I certainly, and we certainly respect that on the fire department. Uh, we'll just go over a few things here. Uh, and of course, as uh, people get older, uh, the risks always get a little bit higher too. Um, uh, we, we don't have the dexterity we had when we were younger, and things like that. Don't have our balance, and it's easier for things to make us fall. And obviously, the older we get. Uh, when we were younger, falls weren't a big deal, but they're certainly a big deal when you get older. So, uh, as I said, people are living longer. They want to stay in their home, own homes. We encourage that on the fire department as well. Uh, where do fires occur? In the home. And who's dying in fires? Well, uh, it, it, it's hard to put a, uh, it's certainly not, not all seniors, not all children, things like that. But of the seniors that are uh, uh, dying in fires, a lot of them are uh, in wheelchairs, walkers. They don't have their rooms set up uh, properly to escape a fire if the smoke detector uh, does go off. And, and another one too is a carbon monoxide detector, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, most common fire scenarios, uh, careless cooking, careless smoking. Uh, we're all finding that smoking is, is becoming passe, I'm glad, but still there's a lot of people out there smoke and we still do get quite a few fires that are caused by careless smoking. Candles, that's a big one. Uh, heating equipment, space heaters, and octopus wiring. That's another one that, uh, especially around Christmas time, that we run into a lot. Uh, as you can see here, there's a, a nice lady cooking her supper on the stove. Everything looks fine. Uh, but you need to keep your, th your eyes on, your, on your, when you're cooking. You need to stay in the kitchen. We find that a lot of fires we go to with everybody, but seniors as well, is they've left the kitchen to do something else. They come preoccupied with something else, and the next thing you know, they have a fire on the stove. And you can see this stove here. Uh, you might chuckle at it and think it's uh, uh, quite a mess. I see it all the time. We see it all the time in the fire department. We see people pile their, especially ceramic stoves, they pile laundry on it, it's an extra shelf. It's very, very dangerous because you turn it on and you can see that you're automatically going to have a fire there. We don't want to do that. This is what it should look like. I'm not saying my home looks like this, but uh, this would be ideal. If you can keep your stove and your counter area clean, uh, that's the ideal situation we're looking for. Clear the clutter. Uh, here's another problem with a big X on it, and I think everybody can see here probably what the, the issue is here. And this gentleman, I'll just go back, this gentleman here has a big house coat on with long sleeves. We get calls for that. I've been to calls over my period where uh, house coats, things like that, get up in the morning, first thing people want to do, put the kettle on, get the kettle going, and they turn the stove on, and it's just as simple as turn the stove on and the ball scores, the hockey scores come on. Turn your head to listen to the scores, the next thing you know, you're on fire. And, and it happens more than I care to say. Tight-fitting clothes, always roll your sleeves up. When you get up in the morning, try to stay away from your, uh, your night clothes when you're, when you're uh, uh, preparing your breakfast. Uh, they're fire return to a point, not like children's clothing are. Okay? And of course, if, you fire, if your clothes do catch fire, I always tell and I teach the kids all the time, I get them to scream it out, stop, drop and roll. Fire works on three things, heat, oxygen and fuel. And you're taking all three of those things away. When you drop down on the ground, roll back and forth and keep rolling, you'll take away the heat, you'll take away the oxygen, and you'll actually uh, get rid of the fuel as well. So it's a good tip, not just for children playing outside in your campfires, but a great tip for adults too. 
this is one also that we run into uh, quite a bit with pot handles out. Not only for seniors, here's a tip. Uh, we've had a lot of calls as children too, because children want to come up, see what's cooking on the stove. What are we having for dinner, mom? Pull the pot over to have a look. We've got a scalded child. Same thing with an adult. They get up in the morning, tie their house, house coat up, go out, walk by the stove. It gets caught in the pot, pulls it all over themselves. These are, these are actual calls. These are, these are things that happen more than I care to, uh, care to admit. So always keep your pot handles turned in. I like something personally myself. People don't use them enough, is use your back burners. Uh, that's a good idea to use the back burners. Also, if you've got children too, uh, it's even more important to use the back burners and make sure you always stay in the kitchen. Uh, it talks here about uh, this person here has grabbed the pot. You can maybe see what one of the problems is. If that pot's very hot, they're going to burn their hand. So in this case, what we want to do, we should be using oven mitts. And that's really important for seniors and adults. Um, the strength is in there, they grab it, and it just seems to be a natural thing. Once they grab that pot and it's hot, they won't just put it down, they'll set it to wherever it's going. And the next thing you know, we've got a, uh, a serious burn that needs looked after. So use an oven mitt to prevent skulls. If you do burn yourself, run your hand or whatever you've burnt under water for five, three to five minutes. And if the burn's severe where you've got a blister or a broken blister, and always remember blisters are nature's bandage. We don't break blisters. Uh, you want to seek medical attention. They can be quite painful and they can also lead to infection very quickly. Again, especially in, in, in uh, older adults. What to do if a potch cast is fire? Tons of times I see this. There's usually what the end result, if you don't look after it properly, the fire department comes in and looks after it. When you're using a uh, pot, when you're cooking with grease, uh, the best thing to always have is a tight fitting lid for it, or a big, even a bigger uh, pan, uh, like a pizza pan or something like that. And what that is, that gives you lots of room to set it on top. What we're doing again is we're taking away that fire triangle, we're taking away the oxygen. And once you take away the oxygen, the fire will go out. Carefully slide the, pot, the lid over the pot and turn off the stove. Do not attempt to move the pot. We were at one recently where, the, well, and we go to them several times throughout the year, where they'll grab the pot and want to throw it in the sink. Water and grease do not mix very well at all. It just causes, a, it's a small catastrophe and uh, we do get burns out of it all the time. So you want, what you want to do, put the, the lid on the pot, turn the stove off and leave it, just watch it. If you have any problems with it at all, please call 911 and we'll come out and we'll look after it for you. But I always tell everybody, it's not worth a, uh, a new vanity or a new, new countertop or uh, even a new kitchen for anybody to get burnt to any stretch of the imagination, please leave the house, call the fire department from a neighbor, and we'll come over and look after. And have a kid-free zone, that's important. Uh, I have four grandchildren, and when I'm out in the kitchen, they love to stand around, and it's so easy to turn your head, and they're over by the stove. So I try to keep them away, uh, get their parents in, uh, to get them out of the kitchen while I'm cooking, and and, uh, and that everybody else should too, because it doesn't take very long for you to turn your head and bang, they've grabbed a pot or grabbed something off the counter. And they say a meter away. I, I like to have them in another room. <laughs> smoking with care. It's a number of cause of fire deaths. That is statistics still. Smoking outside or use large uh, deep ashtrays, that's the thing you want to do. I know most people who really are smoking outside now. Uh, do not extinguish cigarettes in plant pots. Uh, there are quite a few combustibles in a plant pot. As a matter of fact, if you, to tell you the truth, we've been to a couple of fires where the planters actually started on their own. Uh, spontaneous combustion with the things that are in it. Uh, we're finding that is, uh, that's a story for another day, but interesting enough. So you put a cigarette in there, that's uh, just your accelerant to get it going. And never smoke in bed, obviously. We've been through the years. Um, been to those. Smoke, uh, don't smoke when you're sleeping, drinking or taking medications. Never smoke if the oxygen, if you're using medical oxygen for obvious purposes, because oxygen just makes things burn much more violently. Uh, empty the ashtrays often, all the time. Make sure they're out. 
good thing to pour water in them because we see a lot of people, what they do is clean their ashtray out 10 minutes before they had their last cigarette and uh, 10 minutes later, we're there visiting them. Uh, keep your matches and lighters away from children, uh, barbecue lighters, things like that. Uh, they're very curious. We're trying to educate small children about the, uh, the danger of barbecue lighters and matches, but uh, curiosity is, uh, gets, it gets them quite often. Space heaters, again, another problem we have with calls, people buy space heaters in the winter, they want to supplement their heat, or they want something uh, if they run into a problem with hydro going out. Uh, keep it three feet away from any combustible. I'm talking about a couch, chair, curtains, anything like that. Uh, keep them uh, uh, well away from that. Uh, they can get hot enough, and they're not really built to be that clo much closer, because they can cause some problems as well. Uh, electrical safety, you want to check for overloaded plugs with octopuses. We see that. Uh, a lot of people go out, buy good, uh, to Christmas time, good extension cords, good CSA approved extension cords. Um, there are some good things at the dollar store like uh, cards and things like that that uh, uh, you can save money on. But when it comes to extension cords, uh, don't, don't scrimp on them. Get some good ones. Watch for frayed electric, electrical cords. And if you do cover up your uh, cords, which is a good idea, it's, it certainly stops the trip hazard, just make sure that you do change the tape or check underneath frequently because if you do walk on it, uh, you can actually cause the cords to fray and, and deteriorate. So just something to check every now and again when we're doing that. And as you can see, there's one of our octopi there. Power cords are great, so uh, try to stay away from this. I'll guarantee you right now that behind that wall, that's hot, hot, hot. Candles, a glowing concern. In fact, they're easy to preventable. And what I tell the children is very simple. If you leave the room, you know what I want you to do, and it's cute, watch the kids go, <laughs> yeah, blow it out. If mom and dad say, who blows, blew this candle out? You just keep telling them, there was nobody here, so I blew it out. There's no sense having a candle going in uh, in, in a room where there's nobody in there. It only takes a second to relight them again. As you can see here, candle holders are really good. Rather than having a candle we bend again, uh, I, 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 I've been 35 years in the fire department. I've been to about just about every call imaginable, and candles are certainly no uh, difference. They sometimes aren't made properly. They'll burn down one side, not so much on the other, and then you get an imbalance. Over they go, and then you have a problem. And as I said, when you go out, blow them out. Kids love doing that. I get, I'm sure the parents uh, love that every time they leave. Now the kids are blowing the candles out, but that's good. Clothes dryers. One of the things I learned when I got on the fire department from an elect uh, electrical friend of mine, it doesn't matter if your clothes dryer is 20 years old, it doesn't matter if your clothes dryer is 20 minutes old. Never put clothes in them when you go to bed. Never put clothes in them and leave the, leave the house, all right? What happens, and I've been told by electricians, and I've seen it in house fires, where if somebody's got a hoodie, something like that, you throw your clothes in, that string catches on the drum, once that drum starts, stops turning, your, your dryer turns from a dryer into an oven, and it'll, it'll uh, uh, cause a fire. East Quill and Berry, whole family actually lost their life because the dryer started, actually the electrical panel was right over the dryer. It caught fire, disabled that, and guess what it disabled? All the alarm equipment. So uh, dryers are really, really uh, important. So you want to keep an eye on them. Don't put them on and leave. And the other thing is, again, for seniors, uh, or anybody for that matter, when you're installing dryers, make sure it's good metal ductwork that goes in. Try to stay from, away from big, long, uh, uh, plastic, uh, sprinky, slinky things that I call. Because every time you've got a, a bend or an angle in it, it, it's a spot for lint to collect and quite often the lint just a matter of time and it'll, it'll go up too. So, and uh, we wanna make sure that we clean them out and of course clean your, your lint trays out as often as possible. Okay, and as I said, you can see right there, turn the dryer off when you leave home or go to bed. Carbon monoxide, what is carbon monoxide? It's invisible, it's tasteless, it's odorless and it can kill you. We call it a silent killer. Yeah, the results when fuels or, uh, or, or hydrocarbons do not burn completely 
and that's the off-gassing, and that's called carbon monoxide. And the best one is you leave your car dry, uh, leave it running in the garage. So uh, it's very, very important that A, we have uh, carbon monoxide alarms, and B, we try to eliminate some of the sources of it. And to prevent CO in the home, ensure that all your heating equipment is cleaned every year and checked. All right, you should have it checked. That's a good idea too, especially for seniors. Uh, they, I really, not only from a safety standpoint, but from the fact that you don't want your, your, your furnace blowing out in, in January. That's usually when it goes. And it's usually the coldest night of the year. So make sure you get them to come in, have a look at it. And the, one of the big things they check for is any leaks. Uh, make sure your flues and, and your exhaust pipes are all cleared out and, and you're not going to run into a problem there with carbon monoxide seeping back into your home. We certainly never want to bring gas or charcoal barbecues inside, even if it's cold. For, uh, for our senior friends, please, uh, if the hydro does go out, like in the, ga in the, the gas storm, the, uh, the ice storm uh, last year and a couple of years ago, please phone your family, phone anybody to come and get you. Do not bring in any barbecues or anything like that. There again, they will kill you. Just You'll go to sleep and you will not wake up. And they're not that warm to start with. Uh, if you're starting vehicles, I know a lot of people like to start vehicles. If you have them, start them, pull them outside of your garage. Do not leave them running in your garage. It will migrate into your house and it will set your alarms off if you have them. And if, it, if you don't have them, you could actually get uh, deadly proportions in there. Portable generators, very good nowadays, again because of the, light, of the ice storm, but we want to make sure we use them in well ventilated areas. People want them close so they can refuel them, but they do need to be outside because that carbon monoxide can seep into your home. And another thing about carbon monoxide detectors is if you have the plug-in ones uh, and you have a generator running, there's a good chance that that's not, that's not working. That socket's not working, so you always want to back up as well. Electrical backup, excuse me, battery backup. Uh, again, there you can see some of the things. Uh, make sure the portable heaters are all CSA approved. Some people bring gas ones inside. I'm telling you right now, houses are so airtight now, they just will not uh, expel any CO. You know, uh, my house is fairly old and it's got some drafts and things in it, but I'm the exception, not the rule. Most people, and it will accumulate, all right? Uh, again, before you have a fire, uh, check the, the flu, open it, make sure it's clear. Um, check your, uh, all your ports uh, for your dryers, your uh, water heaters, things like that to make sure no leaves have piled up against them. Make sure no wild animals have come in and made a nest in them. Uh, that's happened before too. And as you can see, uh, again, do not run your vehicle in the garage. Smoke alarms. It's the law. It certainly is. Carbon monoxide detectors are law now. Everybody, uh, I will get to that slide in a minute. Uh, so added protection, they have to be on every floor. That's the law. And the fire department, if we get a call to your place, or sometime, you never know, you might drop by, uh, we'll check and we can issue uh, summonses for uh, not complying with the uh, Fire Alarm Act, okay? So uh, make sure you have one on every floor. And one in every bedroom is a really, really good idea. New houses, you're gonna see that happen now. And it's really important to have them in every bedroom. They're not that expensive, and they just save lives so many times. And I see the statistics, and I get them in the office. It's so sad that a uh, rooming house down in, in Hamilton, um, four or five people died down there. The working smoke detectors, you know, and they had them. So you're talking about a dollar battery. You know, it's really sad. Oh, it's his job to do it. It's, it's his job to do it. You do it. He'll make sure it gets done. It's, you know, call us. We'll come and put the dollar battery in. But please do not uh, forget your smoke alarms. Carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, you can see that uh, they should be put uh, probably in your sleeping areas. A lot of people put them down in the basements where their appliances are. Your appliances tend to burp out a little bit of carbon monoxide, so it kind of deteriorates the life of them. The best places to put them is in your sleeping area at floor level around there, okay? And you can see where you need them. Uh, even if you don't have any uh, fossil, fur, uh, fossil burning uh, equipment, if you're beside a storage room, say an apartment that has them, you need them in your apartment. You need them there in the sleeping area. Uh, anywhere, if they're around you tall, you need to have them. We get questions on them. My, uh, ex 
the answer is don't don't make any mistake. You know, error on the uh, caution on the side of error. That's what I'm trying to say. Smoke and seal alarms. Do you have the alarms? Do they work? Uh, for elderly people, please. There's sticks and things, but if you have any problems at all, yesterday we went. I just went before I came here, and helped the nice uh, uh, elderly couple redo their, uh, put the batteries in the smoke detector. We, uh, we, we prefer if you can get family members. Obviously, we can't be going out every day and doing it. But in, in cases where you can't get somebody to come, we're, we'll be help. Please give us a call. Fire department will come and we'll help you change your batteries and make sure that things are safe. Okay. Uh, test them every month. Uh, that's what we'd like you to do. And it's as simple as just using a, uh, a stick or a cane or something like that just to make sure they work. Uh, for people that uh, have uh, the hearing impaired, impaired problems, uh, you can have the vibra vibrating pagers, bed shakers, you can put them on the bed, they'll, and they'll actually have strobe lights where they'll flash. We do find now, just a, as a matter of interest, small little kids don't wake up very well to smoke detectors, so uh, we always try to teach and, and for somebody, the first one to wake up to start screaming and yelling that it's gone off. But there's things that can really help the hearing impaired, impaired and uh, those two uh, devices right there work very well. And you can see what we'd like you to do is change the battery every year. Uh, I, the one I changed helped change this morning. The couple went out and, and I don't want to get any trouble from any battery companies, but bought some cheap batteries. Uh, buy some good batteries. On the fire department and our man down packs that we, uh, that we go into buildings with, which is 20 minutes of the rest of our, the next, well, sometimes the rest of our life, where we go into buildings with, we have good Duracell and Energizer batteries, and then we know that they're going to work. Do the same thing with your uh, smoke detector. Put a good battery in it. And watch for the uh, chirps, too, when the warnings come on. Do not wait for the warnings to come on. I always tell people when the clocks go ahead, or the clocks go back, that's a good time to change the battery. Sometimes if you wait for it to chirp, yeah, that's the fail safe. But if you go to your son or daughter's on a Friday night and you're out an hour and it starts to chirp and you come home on a Sunday night where the battery's completely dead, your fail safe's already run through the course and you come in and you're living there with a, and you don't have any fire protection. So don't always wait for it to chirp uh, when, when it uh, wears down. They do wear out. We get most of our calls for CO and, and smoke alarms because they're around seven years old and maybe a little older. Uh, probably 85 to 90 percent of our calls are for that. Um, we do go and check because they're absolutely alarmed, but uh, if you've got alarms that are there, eight, nine, ten years old, you may want to look at, you know, replacing them, ask them for Christmas. I know some people would think there's got to be better gifts than a smoke alarm, but I, sometimes I wonder that. False alarms. Uh, if you do have a problem, uh, especially with seniors, that when they, uh, in my house, they used to say dinner's ready when the smoke detector goes off. But uh, uh, what happens sometimes you have your smoke detectors, either they're put in the wrong place, too close to a heat source, too close to the oven or a toaster. And there's two different kinds. There's ionization and there's photoelectric. Photoelectric tend, tends to work a little better in the kitchen. The people at the, uh, the hardware stores in town or wherever you do your shopping, they're all well versed on that and they'll help you. Sometimes, or give us a call. By all, by all means, give us a call. I will give you the number too. It isn't 911 if you just want information. 911 is when you have a serious problem and you need the fire department to come right there away. Uh, but yeah, give us a call if you're not sure. We can get you. That sometimes it's just a matter of just moving your detector. Okay. Let's prevent the sp uh, spread of smoke. And that's, if you can, try to keep your doors closed. And we're really pushing it for families and especially adults to close their doors. And uh, uh, it really makes the difference on, in fire spread from, from one area to another. We've changed our techniques and how we actually go in and do a search for rescue, a search and rescue for victims now. And one of them is we count on those doors being shut. Yep. Escape plan is always very good. You can see the one there. Uh, as was brought up earlier, keep the hallways and exits clear of clutter. Two ways out of each room if possible, a doorway and may maybe a window. And choose a meeting place outside. If you come up with your family, if you're in a senior's dwelling, 
uh, wherever, meet in the spot so when the fire department comes you can let us know that everybody's there safe or do we need to go look for somebody. All right, it's really important. And always call the fire department from outside. Either a cell phone or go over and neighbors. Never call from inside. Once out, stay out. And again, maybe practice your, uh, your uh, safety plan. If you're having problems with your CO alarm or it does go off, you're not sure what to do, please do not open all the windows and leave. All right. What we want you to do is leave. Phone 911 will come. We'll bring our monitor up. We'll check it. We'll see if it is faulty. We'll see if you are experiencing uh, CO problems. We can do it really quick. Problem, in, problem is when you open the windows and air it all out, we have to close everything back up and start all the appliances up. And it just takes a bit of time, that's all. So just leave the building and, and uh, leave it for fire to come. And you can see that working smoke detectors, CO alarms, and an escape plan can save your life. Uh, know your emergency number, always, you know, 911. Uh, the fire department number in this area is 519-843-1950. Uh, and that gets the, the uh, we're 830 to 430 down at the Fergus Fire Station. And we'll be happy to answer any of your calls. And for that matter, come out if you have an issue, we'll certainly come out. And we always get the people say, can you just come out late this morning when I went out and looked after the, uh, the, the nice people? Don't bring the fire trucks up with you. <laughs> no. we'll, we'll come up a little more discreetly than that. And we're there to help. Please call us. Uh, there's never any call that's too much for us uh, or too little. Give us a call and uh, we'll be always, always happy to come with any kind of emergency whatsoever. That's our job. We're 24 hours a day. And as quickly as you can, as the smoke detector goes off, get out of your home, go outside, get out your, your escape plan, and uh, phone us, and we'll come and we'll do the best we can. But the most important person is you, and especially our senior citizens. Uh, everything, we've got a lot of nice equipment down at the hall, and it's all because of the hard work of uh, people that did this years ago, all our seniors, and we're very proud of them. I have nothing but respect for them, and please take care. And uh, again, if you have any questions, give us a call. Yeah, okay, so the question is uh, for people in wheelchairs, are there suggestions out there for creating a good escape plan? By all means, you know, um, we have senior buildings in Ontario Housing and things like that in town. We try to keep, you know, try to stay on the lower floors, uh, try to stay away from stairs. If you're in your own home, uh, you want to be careful that, yeah, you should maybe move your bedroom downstairs. Uh, closer to you know, closer to your ramps and things like that. Uh, another one is uh, people with uh, uh, that need some sort of mechanical aids other than other than wheelchairs. There again, they might want to make sure they've got lots of handrails. They might want to reposition their bedroom again if that's possible, down to a lower level, and make sure that they have ramps. But the important thing out of that is, which is a really good question, have a nice sign in front of the door to let us know, and you see it all the time. That, that somebody in there has a wheelchair. That's, that's very important to us. Same as oxygen or anything like that. If we know there's oxygen in the house, uh, we'll certainly, uh, that makes a big difference for us as well. But by all means, yeah, there's a lot of things you can, you can do to, to make it safer for, uh, for people that are um, uh, challenged with, with mobility. The important thing is maybe pre-planning too. Mm -hmm. and, and that might answer your question. Let us know ahead of time. Now, obviously, we're, not going to do, we're going to get there as quickly as we can. But if we do know that when we get there that we're dealing with somebody on the second floor that isn't a wheelchair, um, we'll address that issue right off the bat with laddering and things like that. So the question was about if um, the fire department would come out to help people who may be in a wheelchair or using mobility aids to be able to develop a safety plan. and. Um, that's something that's actually a really great role for an occupational therapist is that because everybody's home is so different there's not one way or one device that helps someone be to be able to get out so for some of that exit planning maybe planning for two accessible entrances or exits and um, helping to be able to make sure that both of those routes are clear is something that um, an occupational therapist could help with okay the question uh, is uh 
you know, what happens is a lot of people live in apartment buildings where the alarm station uh, is uh, activated, the alarms go off, uh, they get up, they go outside, they get up, they go outside, and then after a while, when it's cold out, they just assume that it's, it's, a, it's an alarm. Unfortunately, it's a very dangerous thing, and you can go right back to a few years ago at the MGM Grand uh, down in Las Vegas where a lot of people lost their lives, and that's exactly what happened. If you are in an apartment building or something where you continually have alarm problems, please phone Center Wellington Fire, our fire prevention officer, because that means it's not being maintained properly. And they shouldn't be going off three and four times. We'll go up there, we'll, we'll, take, we'll get a hold of the supervi supervisor, the owners of the building, and he'll make sure that they have those things fixed and, and do the things properly. And if there are being pull stations pulled, which happens, uh, we'll look after that and be very proactive that way. But the, the bottom line is, uh, is, I think, the boy that cried wolf, as somebody said, it's not a good thing because that's just the time. And it's not fire that'll get you. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's the smoke that will get you. So you might, some people say, well, you know, I'll see the fire, I'll run out. Uh, if you leave it too late and the halls are full of smoke, uh, our only alternative is to come up and get you off your balcony, which we can do. But remember, there's a lot of these buildings have 30 and 35 balconies. So just get out of the building. And, and, and if it is a problem, again, have your supervisor contact uh, or you contact us and we'll see why these alarms are going off as often as they are. How often should an alarm go off in an apartment setting or a condo? Well, uh, the question is how, it, yeah, it. yeah, how long, how often should the alarms go off to, uh, when you are testing them? Uh, that varies. There is a, there is a standard that they have to do. Um, every year they have to do a full evacuation. Okay, in particular in senior homes, I'm going to do one early November with all our Ontario housings. Uh, but the alarm companies do have to come in and they do have to test them monthly. Monthly, monthly yeah. They, they're, they're done monthly and to make sure that they are working properly. Now, that doesn't mean they'll maybe, they maybe do a silent alarm and they won't do a full evacuation because in the wintertime it's very hard and particularly in senior buildings, we don't want to drag those people outside. So they'll do an in-place uh, uh, an alarm. And uh, even during a fire, sometimes we can even do a shelter in place, like we do in hospitals and senior buildings. We'll take you to a part of the building that's safe, rather than bringing you out into the elements. Thank you very much, Amanda and Larry, for that amazing presentation. If you at home are concerned about your home safety, let your doctor know, or you can contact the CCAC and they can send an occupational therapist to your home to check it out and try and make it more safe. If you are concerned about fire safety or you know of someone that you're concerned about fire safety for, you need the batteries changed in your fire detector, then you can contact the Centre Wellington Fire and Rescue. Both of these contact information addresses, phone numbers will be provided at the end of this session. Our glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we do. It takes an entire community to prevent a fall. Thank you. For more information about the free, smart, gentle exercise programs in your area, check out the Vaughn Smart website at www.vonsmartexercise.com or contact Smart Program Coordinator Kelly G by phone 519-323-2330, extension 4954, or by email at kelly ge -E at v-o-n dot c-a
The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.